Hey everybody, Stu Smith and Jeff Nichols here with another Tactical Fitness Report. And today we're just going to talk about some things that are occurring, things are happening, uh, changes out there with gyms opening up and public facilities opening up, but some are, some aren't. You know, where do you start again? You know, if especially I haven't been swimming since March. So I am so tempted, for instance, to find a place to swim that's not my normal pool, you know, yeah. which I typically don't do. But um, we're going to go into some of those type of ideas, you know, whether it's uh, build up your home gym or it's get to the gym, whatever that is. So I don't, I'm not really sure what we can title this one, Jeff. <laughs> what's um, next, right? Yeah, what's next? <laughs> yeah, what's next? Because you know, that's a big question. Yeah, what's it's next? So How about the, yeah, what's next with your training? Yeah. You know, in that's this ins- current situation. Yeah, and the, you know, the ideas are, you know, because Stu and I, we, we receive a multitude of emails and, and are appreciative of that, that we're in a position to help. Mm-hmm. And they come from all over. They come from different countries. They come really, in this case, from different states. So uh, a close friend of mine, the, his gym in Omaha, Nebraska, never closed. Um, some pools in certain states have never closed. At places in Texas, uh, you know, the, the temperature, for example, just using Texas example, I was looking at the forecast because my better half is traveling there. The temperature is 95 degrees. There's lots of lakes in Texas. I would definitely so, be forced. Yeah, I bought a tri suit. Um, a, a very close friend of mine lives on a, on a lake here inside the city of Virginia Beach that people can swim and paddleboard and whatnot. So I was like, well, the ocean's cold still, but uh, a, a lake is going to be a little bit warmer, right? And so I was like, my, I'm trying to also get my son a little bit more active right now this time because he's out of school so it's like he loves the paddleboard so we get the paddleboard in the water he's gonna he's gonna paddle next to my swim you know so think outside the box swim buddy think about that get a swim buddy you know yeah it's like jeff you're gonna have your yeah, my son's 13 he's a very capable swimmer he's very capable and i'm a capable swimmer so if i cramp the paddleboard's there whatever it may be because like I, said, I haven't swam since march either yeah Yeah, you know what I was thinking? I had a really good idea. One of my guys um, said that he has a small pool in his backyard uh, that they just opened up. And um, he actually tied a a rope to his waist and anchored it in the flower bushes uh, with with a boat anchor. And uh, he just created his own little endless pool um, without having to turn around every 20 feet you know, of a swimming pool. So I was like, you know what? If my pool doesn't open up June 15th, June 16th, I'm (laughs) going to put one of those little things and I've already been pricing them. I mean, they're really, yeah, you put it on the dock too. That's a good idea. They they sell these, but they, so if you go to swimming magazines, what they'll do, it's called the infinite swimmer. All it is, all it is, is a, is a basically a little nylon belt like you'd wear in your dress whites or dress blues. Mm -hmm. They're thin. And it's got a carabiner clips to it. And it's just one of those, those four foot long exercise bands that's been cut. Right. So, or you can use rope. And so yep. there's, that's another thing is like, you could do that. Like you can just swim in place, honestly, with that, and that rope or that bungee because it will move some. But That'd be nice. I, I need to get in the water after my workouts. Cause yes, it's getting hotter. I need that cool down, you know, because otherwise it, it you know, I can do a little bit in the shower, but you know, it's just not the same cool down when you yep. jump into, you know, 65, 70 degree water yep. and uh, actually cool down after workout. So there, that's two options right there. One being, if you're going to do open water, definitely find a swim buddy or somebody who wants to paddle board next to you, which is, I think, a great idea or canoe or kayak. Yeah. And if you're fortunate enough to be one of those people, that has someone to train with. Like, and I know there's groups like uh, Stu's group. There's definitely groups in California and places mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, you know, someone might swim out to a distance and then you switch. Then someone paddle boards back and the other one swims back and you do that a couple times. Yep. Right. And so just understand that like, what, what, what are we trying to get doing? We're just, we're trying to prepare you guys for when things are truly available. It's like make that one notch closer to being prepared because, you know, whether like we're talking about reintegration to training, that's really what we're talking about. It's like, do we want to like start off with a sprint? You know, mm-hmm. and again, swimming is one thing. And so like Stu, like we could start talking about 
okay, so we've been, so many people have been relegated to just probably bodyweight exercises or minimal band and resistance stuff. So when you, when you, when your guys are going back to the gym, when you get your guys back in the gym, what is that going to look like? Yeah, you know, right now, it, you know, it worked out, I hate to say this, kind of perfectly <laughs> because we, we were transitioning out of our weight room workout anyway, and we're getting into more calisthenics and running. But the thing that we're missing right now is the swim portion that we, we really ramp up to in the spring and summer. Um, so for, for the most part, it's not really affecting us. Now, it is affecting some of my guys that – Come, came in from the endurance background that need to be in that weight room. Right. Um, so we're, we're doing right now, our transition for those guys is everything that we're doing. Um, they are doing, you know, the endurance muscle stamina guys that need to put on some weight. Uh, they're doing with weight vests. So they're doing their calisthenics with weight vests. So their repetitions are cut, you know, 70, you know, 60, 70% almost. And just, just making push-ups harder and pull-ups harder and things like that. So, you know, depending on where your weaknesses are, you can manipulate the training to work on those weaknesses. If it is a strength is issue, if it's an endurance issue. Right now, I'm running and doing calisthenics like crazy. Um, and in fact, so much, I just took the day off because I was feeling the burn. Because you, you, can, you can overwork yourself even with yeah. calisthenics and running. So... Um, you know, be, be wary of that for sure. Um, but yeah, I, our transition when the, when the gym opens, I'm not sure how that's going to look. We may have at our community center, uh, a different timeline than we previously had because there'll probably be a section first thing in the morning where the, the older folks come in and do their workout when it's clean right? Yep. They've cleaned it all night, you know, after the day's done and it's all clean, they can come in first and go in. And then, you know, the younger folks can come in afterwards after them. I'm not sure how they're going to juggle, you know, some of the, uh, the new normal uh, yeah. in the, in those type of facilities, you know, depending on your facility, it may be completely different and it's just, you know, everybody's cleaning and after each other and, doesn't matter what age groups coming in or, or whatever or it's a young musclehead gym that you know tends to cater to you know younger folks anyway yeah. so who knows um i i don't know how that's going to look all i do know is that right now we're doing as best we can to um manipulate our high endurance muscle stamina workouts by adding dumbbell activity trx activity uh, weight vests, just to make the calisthenics harder on those that need more of a strength component right now. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. So again, like, so, you know, there's a transition. So understand like what Stu is saying, just kind of draw back a little bit. And it's, it's not that dissimilar to my request that I, that I give people is that there are very few people that haven't been able to, that have, haven't had to stop with this aggressive resistance training. So a lot of guys definitely probably made a shift, a shift mid training session, whether it's a strength, hypertrophy, power and speed, or any one of uh, uh, Stu's programs. So the point is people like, what do I do? What do I do? Well, since there's been such a long break, my suggestion is you start those programs over. Yeah, but day one. Before that, but even before that, if you were like in the midst of a very intense training program, <clears throat> my suggestion is for a couple of reasons. It's like when you get out of boot camp, you don't want to start off training intensely right away, but that's not, that's not really in your control. Right. But in this, in this case it is. So we want you to, my suggestions when I go, Hey, go to the gym for seven to 10 days, at least about 10, 10 days to two weeks of training of beginning to do the types of intense training movements that you're doing, but still pull back some of that volume. Because what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up immediately overtraining or overreaching. And then you'll be in week three of a program that you can't accommodate that, that much stress. And you're getting sick, get injured. So it, it see what Stu is doing. He's like, hey, we've been doing a lot of running, this, that, and the other. Now we're adding some additional mass, TRX transition, weight bust to implement more stress. But we're not going straight into like, for example, if you've been off training for six to eight to the last two months, 
you don't start week one hypertrophy program of mine. That's not oh, yeah, a great yeah, yeah. place to be. That's a good point. So it's like you can start basically look at the hypertrophy program or whatever and do week one or two, but you pull back that volume by about 40 to 50%. You know, maybe it starts off at 40% mm -hmm. of volume. It ramps up 5% over the mm -hmm. first, you know, couple of days. And then, you know, you end day 14, week two, right? And at still at 75% of volume, go back to week one, full throttle, maybe transition. But again, it's like the best thing you can do is be aware of like what Stu, like Stu's literally living it right now. He pushed hard. What is he doing? He's not like, well, this is part of it. I'm going to keep pushing. No, you stop, you lick your wounds, you take some days off. So why? So you can get back to training sooner because if you don't, you're going to actually overtrain to a point where before you even get acclimated to it, you'll be six, to eight weeks in as opposed to like two weeks, take it easy, take a couple of days off, train real hard for three or four days, take a day off and then train real hard. And now you've accomplished in four weeks, what it was going to take you eight weeks to get there back you. in up to speed. So that's, you know, you don't really have that too much with swimming. Certainly running can do that. Same thing. Sure. Same oh, idea. Yeah. yeah. Right. Weight training is the same sort of dosing. Don't take more than you can recover from. Absolutely. There's definitely a progression with running high rep calisthenics and strength training, right? You just, you just can't jump back into what you were doing if you have neglected being able to do them for the last few months, especially. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. give yourself some time. I, you know, I saw something the other day. Um, I was, uh, I actually had a phone conversation with Pavel, mm -hmm. uh, Satsuline. I think I told you about that yeah. and it went really well. And he, he has a, a company called strong first and he has, he has implemented these five stop signs where it, uh, really is kind of like the, perceived exertion scale a little bit, but it's, it kind of helps you when you're training to understand what failing is, right? And these five stop signs are really cool. Um, I, I've always used to say, you know, instead of jumping into this weight room and going a hundred percent, right. And hitting that, you know, exertion level of 10, you know, pull back a notch, you know, hit six, seven, eight, somewhere around there. I, I've used to always say, instead of, you know, that using that format, I'd always just say, you know, 80% is the new 100%. Agreed. Just to be kind of yep. clever, you know, just kind of pull back a notch. Uh, but some of these are really good, especially when you're dealing with endurance type stamina training, but they also apply to strength training as well. So the first one, I'm just going to go through these real five, these five real quick. Yeah. It just made, it just made pause. So if you yep. guys don't know who Pavel is, yep. when you get done with this podcast, look him up because he really is a pioneer in so many ways. Look him up, digest. He's one of those guys who are like, you should be, you know who Eddie Cohen is. You should know who Pavel is. You should know who Kazmaier is. So he is one of those guys. Definitely look him up. Yeah. He brought kettlebells to the United States from yeah. Russia. He, he's a Russian guy. And I always used to make fun of, you know, the commie exercises that he brings, <laughs> yeah. but He's actually quite a capitalist. Super good. Yeah. <laughs> quite a capitalist. <laughs> yes, he is. So, yes, he is. So anyway, uh, his first uh, stop sign. And like I said, these are just little internal markers that you can notice in yourself or if you're training with others, if they're starting to one, the rep speed starts to slow down, right? If your first rep doesn't match your 50th rep in speed, it is very likely you're going to fail in the next few reps. Yep. Right. So we try to, to notice that and just to avoid that muscle failure. Um, you know, tempo slows down uh, with pauses, you know, um, too many pauses. Like if you're pausing in the up position for your push ups. Um, now, if you're taking a PT test, different animal, you're going to yeah, want to. We're push. talking training, not yeah, testing here. Yeah, there's just training. Uh, breathing rhythm changes. You know, if you notice your heart rate skyrockets, uh, your breathing's, you know, not in a normal pattern. Um, that's another stop sign. Um, technique changes in any way. You know, your back arches for a push up. you start kipping for pull-ups. Those are, 
good indicators that you're about to fail in. And then, like we just mentioned, the rate of perceived exertion, the RPE scale, you know, if that exceeds eight on a scale of one to 10, um, you're starting to push. Now that's kind of a subjective grading criteria, I think, just kind of like my 80% is the new 100%. What exactly does that mean? But those first four are really those good. Those first four things. is what determines five. Yes. That's exactly. What, that, exactly. So it's like yeah. one of those things that, like, you, you, if you listen to Stu, what we've always said, I'm always preaching Newton's second law. That's his first step. Like we're saying movement matters most, his first step. Like, quality of movement always trumps quantity of movement. All these sort of things in fitness and training, they're super valuable because because they're constantly changing too for an individual based on your state of readiness. And that's exactly what we're talking about right now. It's like, don't think that the position of ability, right? Your work output should be the same. And don't also don't be so hard on yourself. It's like, oh my God, my five RM, my three RM, my push up maxes have all suffered. Of course they have. But the, the beauty of adaptation is, is if you approach it with these sort of five stop signs, you're going to get right back up to a new high normal and yep. have the ability to regulate and go beyond. It's like a stair step. It's constantly yep. going to be better. Because what you're going to avoid by following these stop signs is you're going to avoid that overtraining, that central nervous system breakdown that occurs when you fail and, you know, which can really screw up the rest of your workout not to mention the rest of your PT test, if you're taking a PT test, um, and injury, you know, because once your form degrad, you know, degrades, you're, you're going to be more susceptible to those injuries. So for instance, everybody knows who's done a push-up test before, especially when you first started, you've done push-ups. So you're doing push-ups so many reps for the test. It's a two minute test. But let's say you just haven't really quite, adapted to a two minute stamina test as, as that. And, and you've seen this, Jeff, how many times have you seen people or maybe even done yourself, you're trying to get that last rep, then all of a sudden your body has this uncontrollable shaking that occurs yeah. from head to toe. Yeah. What do you think that is? So yeah, that's the neurological limit, right? That there. is a your CNS central nervous system breakdown, which dumps all of your energy that you had into that response, right? So you're, you're, you're really eating up a lot of your glycogen right there. And then by the time you get to sit ups and pull ups and a mile and a half run, you've got nothing left and you just spin yep. it all on trying to get one rep of a push up. So that exact, and I'm being literal here, that exact thing happens when you see someone in a traumatic incident and they go into shock. That's the first step of CNS goes shut down loss of bowels, all those sort of things. So you're like, well, you're telling me, yes, it, it's your body. Here's the thing, folks. Your brain doesn't care if you're doing push-ups or you're in a car accident. It's perceived stress by the nervous system. And, and if you train yourself properly, you handle more stress readily with greater volume, which is why you, like, you look at guys and go, that dude handles great stress. He's able to handle or she's able to handle extreme stress because of the way they trained, not the way they tested. Yeah. So it's like you, that your brain doesn't care. Like you get the shuddering, right? One of the first things that happens in fr fight or flight yeah. is loss of finite motor skills. That's exactly what's happening through the course of fatigue, not through the threat of death or danger or harm. It's the same exact. Same stress. Way. Hormonally speaking, it is the same stress. Same. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what we talk about stress inoculation. We talk about dosing. We talk about um, don't, don't train harder than you can adapt to, right? And, and that's, and I get it. Like there is this, especially this population, you, there is such an emotional drive to succeed. And I, we get it. So what we're trying to tell you, because we've encountered this probably more than a human should based yeah. off of ego and those sort of things we're younger. So as teachers now, we're trying to say, hey, you're on the path, just learn to learn to use your brake just as well as you're able to use your throttle. Yeah. That's why I like those stop signs. You know, it, it is it really is beneficial to actually have some form of internal awareness of your body when you are training, because that internal awareness that you're practicing every time you train is going to really help you later on 
when you have to, you, you realize that you're, you're up too much and you have to down regulate, you know, because when, when your system's really charged and you're, you know, whether it's high stress or high, you know, from training or it's high stress from, you know, just the situation that you're in, you're going to have to breathe, relax, and note, realize that you're even there. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to think through any type of tactical situation, right? Yep. So you got to bring it down a notch. And that's where that internal awareness, practicing that internal awareness in your training can really help you when you're in the phase three of tactical fitness, I call it, which is your active duty operator phase um, and, you know, doing your job. Yeah. So. And, and just notice this, folks, just be, just so we say we're all on the same page. Those stop signs, what Stu and I talk about, at no point are we saying don't train hard. Oh, no. At no point are we saying don't train as hard as you can. Your ability to train with that much ferocity, intensity, and volume, and precision, right? And that's the real expectation of our military, law enforcement, firefighters, we, in sport too, but we're talking the tactical spaces. Precision is necessary for obvious reasons, life-saving purposes, right? Defending one's health, your brother next to you, sister next to you, whatever it may be. Identifying the, what Stu is saying, breathe through these things, learn to do that. And when you, when you recognize, number seven, be aware enough to recognize those. Because what you're actually trying to do is in your training session is to get to those stop signs, recognize them, address them through proper breathing, proper rest periods. Yep. And then how do we reinforce that fatigue and get through those, make those stop signs further away? When you're under in a state of fatigue, we want to focus on movement principles. We want to focus on breathing and we want to focus on continuing to recognize those stop signs. Because if you do that week in, week out, those stop signs get further and further and further away. And yep. that's what we're saying. We want you to have stop signs really far away. Yeah. And the reason why we're even bringing this up is what, here's what happens to people like us. And that is people who are wanting to go do these very intense jobs you know, when they can't do something for a while, and then the next time they can, they tend to overdo it. I mean, it's just a natural response from our personality type. Yep. You know, like if I can't, if I couldn't bench press for six months, and then all of a sudden I found a bench press, I'm like, woohoo, I'm gonna go nuts. Go yep. do some bench press. Well, <laughs> pull back a little bit and uh, yeah, you know, back. build into yeah. it, you know, progressively. Or, you know, I do, I'm very similar to the same way of recovering from injury, you know, when you, you haven't been able to run for six months. And you know you got to build into it gently. But next thing you know, you're like, hey, it feels pretty good. I think I'll push another mile. Hey, it feels pretty good. Next day, I think I'll push another two miles. You know, and your, your progression just goes off the chart way too much versus – you know, keeping it logical and, you know, actually rebuilding that foundation because that's really what we're doing. We're trying to rebuild the foundation that you had before all of this, and then you can stack on and grow from it exponentially, really. That's the whole idea, right? And the first time I heard this sort of methodology it was, a, it was a good friend and mentor of mine, one of the first, Juan Carlos Santana. Mm. We, I was in Boca Raton with a group of guys from the command. We had gone down there pretty regularly to do some training physical training, um, some America's top team, some guys were down there too that he was working with. And he put it, instead of stop signs, he put it in akin to, you gotta reach out and touch that curtain. Reach out, touch that curtain. He goes, you get too close to that curtain, you get wrapped up in it though. <laughs> like, that's what we're trying to do is like, so he goes, sometimes you gotta go for it and run through the curtain. And that's like those tests. Right? Right. But every day, reach out and touch that curtain, reach out and touch that curtain. So you, you wanna push. We're not saying don't push, we're just saying, you know, it's like, think about it. If you're slowly reaching towards a curtain, you're aware. You're really finite. It's like the bottom of your squat should be the point of greatest focus, yep. right? The point of, of all these exercises. And we want you to train like that. So when it comes time to test, you just wind yourself up and you go. Your body only knows proper movement, proper breathing, proper position. And, and that's what we're trying to train in training. Yeah, good point, because I, I like that analogy, too. That makes a lot of sense. And, and that's, you know, it, it's really hard to define 
you know, what I have done in the past is, you know, like if I'm doing a pyramid, you know, just go up to you can't do anymore and then come back down. Well, what's that mean? Right. Does, does that mean I fail to a point where I'm shaking on the bar? Well, I didn't really explain that very well, you know, and, and after talking and learning a little bit more about these stop signs, it just made a lot more sense to me that I need to better explain what I mean by failure. Yeah. Right. Right. right you know, yeah. Fatigue is a little bit, is a little bit different than muscle failure. You know, yeah. fatigue is the goal. You know, yeah. you want to fatigue it to a point before you hit that muscle failure. And if you don't believe me, here's all you got to do. Test yourself one day and yeah. just say, you know what? I'm going to do a few sets of just balls out hundred percent until I start shaking. I mean, you're not, it's not going to be pleasant. Um, but it's certainly doable. Then try to see what happens the next 20 minutes of your workout. Yeah. Just see where you are. And you may be surprised at your inability to perform, you know, at 50% of what you typically do at that point. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think that again, maybe you're right. Like I fa failure is a very interesting word because I, I think most people attribute that as a finite absolute. And in training, it's not, it's, 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 it's a constant needle that's changing throughout your set and reps. Yeah. And so, if, so same with me, I, I define failure as an inability to manage in, in, a purposeful acceleration. Like I'm choosing to move this fast when I no longer can move it that fast from that position, that's failure for that set. Yes. But what is it? So I always do this as like the baseball analogy. If I put up a hundred baseball tees with balls on it, and I said, I want you to swing as fast as you can from one tee to the next. You know, by the time you get to the sixth swing, you're pooped. But I say, take, take three seconds in between each swing. Now you're getting, to, you're getting to swing 18 maybe. And I go, okay, take three or four hard swings, three or four hard breaths, three or four hard swings, four or five hard breaths. And now all of a sudden you're at 45 swings before your, your movement pattern breaks down, the bat speed breaks down. Right, because if you watch, like, go to high school baseball practice, you see a bucket of balls and they're swinging fatigue. Go to a major league batting practice, they're taking three to five swings before they rotate out. Why? Because in a game setting, their average swing is 2.1 to 2.3 swings per at bat. So why are we swinging 14 times? You're propagating fatigue. Yeah. So that's why training to true failure, what we're talking about, is a terrible idea but training to this point of failure using these stop signs is going to get you more swings, higher velocity, you, you know, you bench press, pull up, yeah. push up, use whatever you want, but it's finite. It's a movement pattern that's maintained with the maximum amount of effort and you're aware of it. Yeah. One thing I have learned too, is that, you know, some things that I've written in the past, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed about reading today. <laughs> right. Just because I, that means I, you're doing, you've done it right. Then. I have grown. Right. <laughs> and I, re, I remember writing this article once you, you succeed by failing. Right. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it's a clever title. That's all it really is. It doesn't fully explain the, you know, what I mean by failing. And I probably didn't really explain what I mean by failing in the article either. I was just like, go until you can't do anymore. Take a break. Try it again. Take a break. Yep. Right. But you know, I, I, I like these little objective grading criteria for what failing is, or should I say, we don't want to get to failure. We want to get to fatigue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And th that's probably a better way to explain it versus saying, go to muscle failure. Yeah. We want to go to muscle fatigue. fatigue. Yeah. We don't want to go to that central nervous system breakdown of muscle failure. Yeah. At all. Because then everything shuts down. Like yeah. Your ability to contract, your ability to move something, the ability to stop something, your self, right? Yeah. And that's where it's like, oh, wait a minute. I can get better quality reps with greater time. Because we're talking mechanical advantage now and time under tension does better at hypertrophy development, strength development, and motor function enhancement. So you get all of it, right? When you're when you're really aware, that's what I say your best friend is your rest period and what you do during that rest period. Yeah. Right. Are you breathing through it? Are you focused on, it? are you moving? Are you drinking water? What do you, what, how, how is it that you can best enhance your rest period? Yeah. And you know, and depending on what you're doing, whether it's a strength exercise where you truly need rest or it's a muscle stamina exercise when you're you can, 
you can you can rest with an active rest, maybe doing something, you know, a little less, maybe a different muscle group, maybe a, you know, a different system altogether, just kind of running, you know, jogging, biking, you know, whatever that is in between your pull-up sets, you know, just to rest your muscles that are being worked that hard, but you're never really resting the body. So it really kind of depends yeah. on, you know, what your goals are at the end of that, uh, that workout cycle, but now's the perfect time to do this right now is the perfect time to, again, we talked about before. It's like one of the best things you can do to get back into training is like work on your sleep habits. Now work on your dietetic habits. Now work on these recovery habits, these resting habits, these being aware of how you feel, not based on the number in the program, not based on the, like, cause again, like whether it's my program or or Stu's, the numbers we're putting in there, those are just starting points. Those are like, hey, here's a good starting point for you. Either bring your percentage down if you need to, bring it up, right? Increase your rest period or shorten it. That's what we're talking about. You know, really probably the reps and sets are the ones that are probably really truly prescribed, but our rest periods, right? Like I said, manipulate them. Sure. Okay? Absolutely. Manipulate them. Yeah, especially as we're transitioning back into a – modality of training that you have not been able to do in significant amount of time. So whether exactly. that, you know, if this was, you know, we may see this again in the fall when we are transitioning out of our running and we're getting back into the weight room, you know, then what do we do? Yep. That's going to, that's going to be, a, it's going to be a new question for me. You Come bet. up with something creative on that one. <laughs> um, but, you know, hopefully, you know, with some, you know, weighted calisthenics, you know, bands, TRX, you know, dumbbells outside, you know, whatever that is that we, we have to do backpacks, sandbags, yep. um, sleds, you know, we, we can, we can make it happen. I mean, we, we can still work on strength and power without having a, you know, squat rack available yep. to us. Good um, programming can accommodate pretty much you know, about the only thing that body weight training bands and certain other things can accommodate is, is skill acquisition for certain things in the sport. But as far as like physical development in this time period, making good use of it and, and, and creating that real purposeful fatigue, man, like you really, you're, for those of you that have been, you may not even know you've done it, applied this timeline really well. You get some of you're going to be like, man, I got right back into the weight room and, and right back in the pool, you know, in about seven to 10 days. Why? Well, because you are practicing awareness and mindfulness in your training. And that's kind of a lot of people were forced to do here. It's like, well, I can't just do a multitude of machines that do all the support structure for me. It's like, yeah. I really have to focus on these things that I've been putting off right and, and that's i think a lot of you are going to be really which is probably so many of you are really itching to get back in because you probably already noticed your improvements in this time of focusing on things that you otherwise may not have you know what I, I think a lot of people will be pleasantly surprised especially if they weren't used to doing a calisthenic cycle and they did a calisthenic cycle for the mm -hmm. last 10 or 12 weeks that they really didn't lose that much when they got back into the weight room you know, it, it has a way of maintaining a certain level of strength. But, you know, if you're looking for your one RM max, you'll probably need a good four to six week cycle to get back up to those yep. one, one rep maxes. But, but for easy. those people that overtrain, were overtrained when this thing happened. Yeah. And then went into a forceful calisthenic band TRX type thing. I bet yeah, some people have gotten even stronger. I yeah, you go into yeah, <laughs> give yourself a few heal. days. Give yourself a few <laughs> yeah. days to kind yeah, of yeah. That's not that's not a challenge. Don't don't start on day one with a one that's, RM. That's not a challenge. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I always found that I was always stronger after a week off of lifting compared to if I took a week off of running. It's like I never ran before in my life. You know, it's like yeah. starting all over again. It was awful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so. So I think, you know, like we, I'm certain we've got our point across, but yes. And, and as folks, as, as things change again and things are a little bit more concrete nationally, whatever that means, as far as openings of things. And because, you know, like if you see videos from gyms in Hong Kong, we have plexiglass in between every piece of equipment and you're like, all that, 
you know, like Gold's Gym declared bankruptcy. 24 Hour Fitness is we're going to be right there. Lifetime, one life. I don't, to be honest with you, not to be a naysayer, I don't see gyms, big gyms being around in six months. I just don't see it. You know, I think, I think the that new they can normal handle is, it. The new normal is <clears throat> invest in companies gyms. that make yep. home gyms. Yep. Like that's yep. where we're going to end up being. Not because people don't want to go to gyms. I think that the people that want to go is a very, very, very small percentage in most already. states revenue. It's already a small percentage, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so now you have you guys, the men and women that are just, that's what they do. That's their thing. That's their social. There's not enough of those people to keep gyms open. There's plenty of those people to get supplement companies going. There's yeah. not enough of those people to keep gyms going. Right. Cause a lot of them like, the revenue that's generated by most big gyms, I didn't understand this because Catherine is a manager for a lifetime, a big global business. Majority of their revenue comes from personal training. Yeah. That's a very small percentage of that small percentage. So the vast majority of people are going just on their own. Well, now you're going to find a lot of gyms that are only doing one-on-one -on -one training with personal trainers. Gyms will not be able to stay open. Yeah. My maybe opinion. more yeah, that's a good point. It may be more of a one-on-one, -on -one, like boutique style uh, yeah. training. So CrossFit gym should do, I would imagine, do very, very well. I would Probably, imagine yeah. they, they should do fine. Take their stuff outside a little bit. That, that's yeah. always nice. An outdoor gym. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's, well. that's, yeah. that's what's happening in a lot of places too, is like outdoor spaces or, or, you know, for gym spaces. But, you know, we don't really know. Yeah. Um, what, what we know is there's a lot of people that want to go back. But whether or not there's a place to go back to is the real question. Yeah. There's a lot of overhead in having those type of facilities. Yes, too. there is. You know, you know, <laughs> yes, is. there is. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there is. And I, you know, fortunately for me, my, you know, my flooring will be in in a couple of weeks and the solar equipment. Um, but my model won't change. You know, I'm only training, you know, teaching one or two people at a time. Yeah. That's I, smart. That's, that's where I sit. And then and fortunately I've got that business model to do that. I'm super blessed. So, um, and we'll we'll grow it as best we can to facilitate better teaching to the multitude. You know what? I, I didn't have that online I, stuff. I think for you, absolutely, you you got to have um, a video component that um, you know of things that you are doing. You know, and yep. you can add a lot of revenue to that type of business if you're going to stay open. But it, yeah, we're going to see some different business models with, with fitness for sure. Yep. It's, sure. it's a little bit scary for everyone. You know, it's like one of those things that there's no sure thing right now. Um, but, but what we, what we do know is that the service that like, you know, I speak for us, the service that we provide is something that we, we find real value in. So, other, so do other people. So we're going to be creative. We're going to keep doing what is best truly for those, for those that want to serve this country yeah. and uh, we'll, we'll adapt. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you want to find out what Jeff is up to, check him out at uh, performancefirstus.com, mine, stewsmithfitness.com. And uh, if you got any questions, post them in the video uh, comment section below. We'll get to them. Got ideas for future topics to discuss. Yep. We'll uh, happily enter entertain those as well. So uh, thanks for listening and uh, good luck with this next uh, phase of whatever <laughs> the mystery phase <laughs> whatever you're in whatever state you're in it's probably gonna be a little different so yep. hang in there america we'll get on it well thanks jeff appreciate it Sue.